This sort of image of robots and reskilling is all quite daunting, and change is something that we're all going to have to get used to. And I remember when I left the corporate world, having been an accountant my entire life, I was faced with a huge amount of people saying, oh, how exciting, and oh, you know, it's going to be really exciting, and aren't you brave? And inside I was thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do? Um, and I just think this will be something that we have, that will be normal. We'll all have to do it. Things are changing so fast. So first of all, we're going to hear from Ariel, and then we're going to hear from Ian, and they'll take us through sort of those two similar journeys about why it's going to change so fast, and then how we might be able to use what we've already got in terms of our skill set and capabilities to still be relevant as it changes. So first of all, I'm going to welcome, give them a big round of applause to Ariel. Uh, hi. When we uh, think about rescuing, uh, we tend to be biased as skills are usually connected with persons or in general with the human beings. Uh, today I'll try to discuss this topic with a broader, much, much broader uh, perspective, uh, treating skills as something that can be developed and delivered by both human and non-human resources. Uh, these non-human resources are, are various solutions based on intelligent automation that uh, successful companies are leveraging on uh, nowadays. Uh, yes, so uh, w I'm Ariel Vrona, which, uh, and also I am the member of the think tank Center of Excellence in Talent Development and Learning uh, node of Polish Accenture. Um, my session will consist of two parts. In the first part, I will show you uh, some insights related to intelligent automation and also why there is such an urgency for us to follow this trend. Uh, the second, the second uh, part will be uh, consisting of the new skilling model, uh, something that we've been developing uh, in Accenture and what we are showing our clients in order to make them able to be prepared for the world of tomorrow. Uh, but before we start, uh, let me briefly introduce Accenture. Uh, our mission is to help organizations to maximize uh, their potential. Uh, we do it by developing, designing, and maintaining, and also scaling uh, mainly uh, technological solutions. Uh, there are almost half a million of us in Accenture, and every time when I'm saying this number, it makes me feel so small and insignificant. Uh, we are, deliver, uh, we are, we are um, in 50 nodes uh, located around the world. Uh, that helps us to get in touch with our clients in more than 120 countries. Uh, I am also representing the Capability Network, which is a special uh, part of Accenture. Uh, we are a team of experts for hire. Uh, we uh, are given our expertise to the nodes located around the world. Um, and this is like the great example of how the, the organizations can leverage on the, uh, on the, um, flexible models of workforce. With this approach, we fall into the borrow category of new skilling that I'll be talking about in a few minutes. But first, let us start from the beginning. Uh, who of you is afraid of intelligent automation? Please raise your hand if you are. <laughs> one or two hands, okay. Uh, and if you think about robots uh, and the movies like uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, like uh, Terminator or Ex Machina, who of you is afraid of such robots? There are more of us. But there's nothing to be shy. I mean, those, those fears are so common that we even have the psychological condition called uh, robot anxiety. Uh, but but uh, let us start from the beginning. The 
the term robot was first used in 1921 by the Czech artist uh, Karol Čapek. Uh, it was used in his, uh, his uh, play, which was called R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots. Uh, we Poles understand this term uh, as a Polish language is close to the Czech, uh, as robota, uh, which is simply work. So we can then translate robot into a worker. Uh, seeing these pictures, we can uh, see that the, the way that we see automation was evolving uh, in the past decades. We started uh, with, um, with automating simple tasks. But the reason why we did it was what is be because robots are doing things cheaper, faster, and they are more accurate with humans. So we, they are simply better. Uh, we started by uh, changing tellers with the ATMs or introducing the, uh, the, 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 the robots in the, in the lines of the factories. Uh, these days, robots were doing these repetitive tasks and people were focusing on those more client, fa client or human facing, uh, facing activities. But it's all changed. And uh, in this age of customer obsession that we are right now, uh, we are letting robots to, to interfere with humans. And that's what we see when the chatbots are, uh, are doing our recruitment processes. To be honest, this is how I <laughs> got to Accenture. I was interviewed by the chatbot on Facebook. Um, also, we can see that the, the banks are are in a position to let machines uh, tell what trades they need to buy or, or, or to sell. Uh, keeping in mind that the technology is constantly learning, we will be now in the future having those autonomous cars, autonomous uh, aircraft, autonomous trades also. When when it comes to these scenarios, uh, in these scenarios that I've just shown you, there's a possibility that the people will be assisting robots in doing creative stuff. Uh, but there is no consent in terms of how these future uh, scenarios will look like. There are some negatives and some positive uh, scenarios, uh, and they differ. But what they are uh, agreeing on is that the auto, uh, intelligent automation will be the next major disruption, for sure. Uh, let me then show you some examples of how it might look like. Soon, it will be like in two or three years, we will have uh, a skyrocketing of investment in AI. It will be changed in, like ge geometrically. And I can tell you that we've seen this uh, in our talk with the clients. Honestly, since I've joined Accenture, I've never been on a project that did not involve automation at all. And the second prediction is about customer service. Uh, those guys will be automated like in a whole. In the next two or three years, robots will be using uh, all channels to communicate with people. It will be voice, texts, and video. So that is why customer service is first to fall. Uh, this prediction, this is really vague. Uh, I found OECD uh, report claiming that it will be 10%. Uh, McKinsey report claiming it will be almost 50% of the jobs that will be automated. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I will show you even our own research that will make the picture even more complicated. Uh, but the numbers, numbers we should treat as indicatives. Uh, the, what is important is that, that they are trying to show us something that we will need to face 
in the near future. And also the thing that comes from our research is that there is a really high trap value uh, behind intelligent automation. Making the wise pivot into the intelligent automation can bring the real benefit to, our, to all organizations. But to make this pivot, we need to embrace intelligent automation. Uh, let me give you three thoughts on how uh, can we do it that, 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 that might be useful in here. The first thought is that uh, the more um, rule-based tasks will be, the more they will be likely to be automated. Going up this pyramid on the left side lowers the risks of being uh, automated. But it doesn't mean, however, that uh, that the human or the creativity-based jobs are like the future-proof. Because we now have AI-based composers, uh, AI-based painters. And by the way, have you ever had a chance to be witness of a really creative stuff done by the computer? Like, you know, what was that? Like the deep fake, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so outrageous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something else? So uh, you should also maybe check Iva, which is artificial intelligence virtual artist. This is an AI-based uh, composer who writes really interesting scores. Uh, the second thought is from the Maslow's pyramid uh, perspective. While robots will let us, mm, uh, let us uh, focus on those lower based uh, needs, we will also always need a human interaction in terms to do uh, the human stuff. Uh, the third thought is about how the intelligent automation will have an impact on our jobs. The common thinking is that automation will just replace some jobs uh, while making the others. Yeah, that's, that's true, but also what is important, or what will be more important, is how it will uh, reconfigurate the positions. Uh, let's take uh, an example of nurses. They will be able to rely on intelligent systems in terms of doing the paperwork and thus, uh, releasing their free time to the patient care, which is really cool, I guess. Uh, having in mind this intelligent automation thing in relation to, uh, to uh, new skilling or reskilling, we should keep in mind just two, two things, that it can be uh, either automation, which is, in fact, uh, erasing some, uh, automating some, 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 some uh, previous tasks uh, while creating new jobs uh, for the people that were doing this before, or augmentation, which is simply uh, like a synergy uh, of human and machine in the workplace. Um, yeah, and to wrap it up, I think that we should always think about intelligent automation as something that uh, is to optimize people's engagement with really creative stuff while letting computers do this boring parts. And to finish this part, I would like to invite you to a short exercise. Uh, maybe think about how your work will be automated and how it will be augmented in the next 10 years. It's hard to tell, right? Okay, let's assume that you are ready. <laughs> Here are s uh, some data uh, from, from uh, our Accenture research showing uh, the level of automation and augmentation in relation to some job families. As you can see, the more rule-based job is, the more prone it is for automation. What is also really 
interesting is this gray part of the chart. Uh, it shows that an average, only 11% of our jobs will not be impacted by intelligent automation. When it comes to those rule-based tasks, it is just three or four percent. So, how your organization can stay in the game? Any thoughts? Because the answer is quite simple. You need to uh, decide how you want to resolve the expected skill gaps. Uh, that's easily said, but it's hard to, uh, to then implement. Uh, because those changes need to be done like on the multiple levels. Uh, it needs to be changes in carry paths, like in the learning offerings and in talent strategies. Uh, from our Accenture research, we know that in a decade from now, the world of the work that we know will no longer exist. Uh, one to two out of 10 jobs will be completely automated. And some of them will completely uh, disappear while new ones will be uh, introduced. And how we can prepare for that? This is something that we call a new skilling model that we've developed and it consists of four ways and three dimensions on how you can do it. Those three dimensions are pools, uh, which are simply uh, what workforce you actually need, um, rules, what are the key assumptions you need to take to uh, design and implement your workforce, uh, and tools. So what are the tools you need to uh, to have to assess, manage, and track your workforce. In terms of the ways it is built by, borrow, and bought. Now, having this said, let me go and show you some examples on how you can do it from the companies that are already there in the market. Well, when it comes to build, it's not only about upskilling, it is about reskilling, it is about learning, unlearning, relearning on the regular basis, uh, day by day, all the time on each device. Uh, one of the, our findings suggests that the, uh, the employers underestimate the willingness of their workforce to acquire new skills. Um, only 3% of executives say that they will significant, significantly increase their investments in the reskilling and learning projects in the next three to five years. While 67% of employees believe that they still need to have new knowledge to, in, a, in order to be able to uh, compete and to be, uh, to be able to, uh, to work with those intelligent technology in the three to five years from now. And this is like the good example of how we can use the pools of the workforce that you have already in your, uh, in your organizations. Uh, AT&T employs around 280,000 people, uh, most of whom got their education and, uh, and the fundamental training in the past era. Uh, but Instead of hiring new talent, AT&T decided to rapidly reskill their workforce while striving to engender the culture of perpetual learning. Uh, this is the action without precedent because uh, this is like tens of thousands of jobs. Uh, these are the millions or billions of dollars of stakeholder value and the future of the most iconic, one of the most iconic brands in the corporate history. Um, if they succeed, they will show a blueprint uh, for how the legacy technology companies can compete with the digital native companies as Google or Amazon. Uh, when it comes to buy, uh, the, the word for talent 
is very much relevant. The companies need to uh, seek new ways to hire and attract people. And um, of course, they need to have or they need to uh, secure the correct uh, employee uh, experience, employee value proposition or employer uh, brand, but they can also use technology in this. And this is what Deutsche Bahn uh, is doing. Deutsche Bahn, the previously state-owned company, uh, railway company in Germany. Uh, they are using VR, uh, VR to um, get in touch with uh, more blue-collar workers and academic specialists. Uh, they do it by releasing videos of how actually the work uh, w looks like for this position and uh, that's help people to see uh, what they will be doing before they apply uh, for a job. I must admit that this is really, really appealing. Uh, Boro, I've told you about Boro before. That's how we are working the Capability Network. Uh, but the, one of the findings of our re uh, report is that the um, lack of the local or, or internal talent is the barrier to scale the business. And uh, to overcome this obstacle, you can, um, you can join the sharing economy by uh, connecting to the, uh, to the experts, to the whole networks uh, of, the, of the intelligent, intelligent people that are out there and maybe in your, your organization, like for example, Valve that is uh, letting the, their people to, uh, to uh, pick the right, uh, the right uh, projects for them based on their interest and skill level. And uh, they do it on a project basis. For example, Johnson & Johnson uh, leverage on Tongle's network of more than 150,000 uh, creatives to produce uh, 280 uh, multilingual brand materials that otherwise need, would need to be delivered in-house, uh, which would uh, cost them a lot. And what it is most important in terms of this, uh, this uh, new, uh, new skilling model is that you have to Think about what task you would like to automate, uh, because the future cannot simply go by without having this work uh, synergies between people and machines. Like for example, Morgan Stanley, they did it by uh, letting the uh, financial uh, financial advisors be augmented with the. Uh, machine learning algorithms and uh, they have that, the project that called the next best action. Uh, it shows the idea that they want to augment those people uh, and differentiate between how they want to do it because this people plus machine uh, solution would be like the, in their mind, better solution for wealthy families than this basic robot advisors are uh, for the masses. And when it comes to this practical side of what we just heard, uh, we might see the here like the example that I have prepared uh, or how can we do it? How can we build, buy, borrow and bought uh, our workforces or how we can prepare our people uh, for the future? And in this case, I've chosen to, to, to show you the my case, like the consulting, which is the project quality office. And I will do it quickly because I see that I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, in terms of buy, we can upskill our people uh, with the data analytics because we need to think about this future, this goal that we have that we need to augment them in order to be able to meet those future uh, future uh, challenges, like when they will need, uh, they will know how to uh, pick the right data from this big data assets. They will be more uh, 
more likely to pick uh, what is needed to be done uh, before our clients will be not happy with our services. Uh, in terms of buy, we can also hire an AI or uh, the data analytics uh, lead who can then establish a data analytics uh, center in our company. Uh, when it comes to borrow, we as a big consulting company, we can engage with the boutique consulting and ask them to show us what they think we need to do in order to uh, make this uh, progress. And the bot, bot is easiest. We just need to, we need to simply put the chat bot that would be like the first level of support for project teams. Uh, yeah. So quickly going to the end. When we know that uh, the future workforce is not consist only of people, this is all also like the machines, um, we need to think about them like all the entities that are able to get the job done. And having that said, let me check, uh, walk you through the uh, new skilling catalysts that might be uh, useful for you when you would like to uh, get what I've just said into practice. Yeah, you would need to align the workforce to the new business uh, models. Our Accenture research says that 42% of executives say that intelligent automation will be behind every new innovation in their organization in the next five or three years. Uh, who of you is in the same position? I wanted to make it dramatic. But <laughs> this is a call, act, a call to action to you, uh, that you have to uh, help your people, your workforce, uh, to be able to meet the, uh, the expectation of your customers that are right now becoming more increasingly more tech savvy. Uh, the second thing is that you need to recognize the right business case. Uh, just not simply bank the profits to benefit, benefit the bottom line. Uh, turn the investments, uh, the savings to investments in your workforce. Uh, train them uh, so that, that uh, they can then be able to meet this future, uh, this future task. For example, we at Accenture uh, put 60% of our savings uh, from intelligent automation to our training, uh, training in terms of the new skilling of those people that were out to, uh, their, their tasks were automated uh, previously. So they are now even getting in touch with this AI and new projects. Also, you need to organize for agility as you have those people that are now uh, more um, work in the more project-based realities, and uh, they are given more autonomy and decision power. They need to have an agile workforce, uh, work uh, environment to be able to just do what they are now supposed to be doing. And when it comes to the leadership, yeah, you need to also change the leadership model because if you have those people that are uh, augmented with this new skills, it goes up the ladder. The leaders also need to be somehow backed by the technology. Yeah, and uh, all we, what have we seen today is just like the micro space of what needs to be done when you are back to your uh, companies. And uh, each of these elements need to be broken down and analyzed according to your, your uh, situation. And uh, my intent was to like to spark the idea that you could make your own and then prepare your people for the future. So when it comes to this, it's all from my side. Thank you for being so patient. And let's now hear how Ian is helping actual people to stay in the market.
Yep. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Excellent. Right. Take two. Let me start again. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as I said, my name is Ian Borkett, and I work for Union Learn. Uh, Union Learn is the learning and skills organization of the Trades Union Congress. I'm Union Learn's service manager, and um, have, I have responsibility for uh, delivering uh, Union Learn's supporting learner strategy and leading on our information, advice, and, and guidance work. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon uh, about the need for all of us to continually reskill and retrain to support performance and, and, and career progression. So just to give you a quick overview of my presentation this afternoon, I'd like to start by giving you a, a brief introduction to uh, union-led learning, who we are and, and what we do. Uh, we hear a lot about millennials. Well, this afternoon, my presentation will focus on perennials. And as a perennial, I am going to be championing the cause of, of other perennials too. It's those midlife workers that need to constantly and continuously reskill and retrain in order to remain active within the labour market. I'd also like to give you an insight into uh, an exciting European Erasmus Plus project we undertook last year called Midlife Skills Reviews, a project that aimed to support low-skilled midlife workers to reskill and remain in the labour market by reflecting on their transferable skills, looking at their development needs and their career options. I will also uh, be demonstrating to you uh, a new, innovative, uh, value my skills, digital skills assessment tool, which was one of the uh, main assets we developed as part of the European project. And then finally, I'd like to share with you our, our future ambitions and aspirations for, for taking this uh, work forward. So, Last year, Union Learn supported over 220,000 learners. Since Union Learn's inception more than 13 years ago, we have supported more than 3 million workplace learners. The foundation of this workplace learning is the workplace learning representative. These reps have legal rights to negotiate with managers carry out skill surveys, and help their co-workers to learn and develop. Union Learn has trained more than 44,000 union learning reps, and they are trusted workplace intermediaries. The union learning rep model has been praised by OECD, Department for Education, and the Education Select Committee as an effective method of engaging low-skilled workers into training. I like to say ULRs have the Heineken effect. Well, you may remember the advert uh, with the strap line, Heineken reaches the parts other beers cannot reach. Well, ULRs reach the learners other organisations cannot reach. The ULR is a unique workplace role that can engage hard-to-reach learners. So where can ULRs be found? Now, this slide is by no means uh, exhaustive, but it gives you a flavour and a sense of some of the household companies and organisations, the length and breadth of the country that have union learning reps or union reps engaged in workplace learning. You can find union-led learning taking place in private, public, and third sector organizations. We have more than 2,700 learning agreements with employers and over 350 union-led workplace learning centers. 
So that's a bit about us and, and, and union learning. Um, moving on to look at some of the challenges. Economic commentators predict that the labour force in Europe is pro projected to decrease by an average of 2 million every year up until 2030. Aging countries won't just need lifelong learning, they will ne need wholesale reskilling of existing workforces throughout their life cycle. And yet, much of the debate still focuses on the needs of millennials. We need, we need to change this narrative to look at how workplaces can also support perennials to reskill, retrain, and renew their skills. To retain the talent, experience, and expertise of older workers. Lifelong learning will be one of the defining issues of our age. Countries and employers who get it right will have an exceptional competitive advantage. In the UK, by 2025, there will be one million more people 50 and over and 300,000 fewer people 30 and under in the workplace. One in three of the working population will be over 50. Perennials are the workforce of the future. This is a trend that cannot be ignored by employers. Although the future may be uncertain, what we can say with some certainty is the pace of technological advancement will transform the world of work and change will be continual. Employers will need to develop age-friendly workplaces to support perennials meet these challenges. We need to rethink skills in order to tackle the talent shortages. Automation and AI will result in profound structural shifts in the UK workforce, and this will be amplified by other mega trends, uh, such as the ageing population. The accelerating pace of technological change, particularly from automation and AI, means that 85% of jobs in 2030 don't exist yet, and nine in 10 workers will need some form of reskilling by 2030. Lifelong learning and support will be essential for perennials uh, to adapt and develop the new skills required in the future. Workers can also expect to change jobs more frequently. According to some commentators, a worker will have 15 to 20 different jobs in a lifetime. The content of work is also changing faster, and in two years' time, 54% of the existing workforce will need to be upskilled or retrained. Employers are beginning to recognise the challenge and impact of current and future talent shortages. A Confederation of British Industry survey found that 80% of firms stated that access to skills was the most significant threat to the UK's labour market competitiveness. I'd now like to move on and, and, and talk to you about an, our exciting European project we led on with uh, our five European partners. Um, some of my union learning colleagues refer to this as Ian's midlife crisis project, but um, I beg to differ. Um, the aim of uh, the Midlife Skills Review project was to develop a digitally supported midlife skills review that can help prepare workers to be more resilient to labour market changes they face in the future. The Erasmus Plus European project was set up to develop interventions that both aid and support workers in midlife. Some of the uh, main project outcomes was to train a network of midlife skills champions across Europe to promote and deliver midlife skills reviews. 
to design and deliver an online training course for midlife skills reviewers so that they could effectively and confidently, confidently carry out with the review process uh, and develop a skills assessment tool uh, to digitally support midlife skills reviews and look at the use of digital badges for recognition of, of learner, learner achievements. So, why are midlife skills reviews so important? We know that losing a job after the age of 50 is more likely to lead to long-term unemployment. Midlife skills reviews help workers review their options and skills to remain active in the labour market. The Value My Skills transferable assessment tool can help workers uh, begin to anticipate their future skills and development needs. It helps start a positive conversation about the individual's strengths and aspirations. We don't have many opportunities at work for these kind of uh, positive conversations about ourselves. Organisations can greatly benefit from retaining perennials and offering flexible working. And yet research carried out by the insurance company Aviva found that 44% of older workers feel unsupported in their career ambitions. Employers are more likely to retain perennials if they thought their work mattered, their employer supported them, and their needs were taken seriously. Skills and careers development uh, are a key tool in employee management, and this is important for perennials as for anyone else. I've already sort of touched in my presentation on the economic and technological impact, and we know people over the age of 50 uh, are still discriminated at work and have less training and development opportunities. We all have very complex and busy lives, uh, and perennials need support to help them appraise their situations, identify their goals, and put in place the steps that will help them achieve them. A career in the midlife skills review model means the whole of life, underpinned by values, interests, skills development, relationships and networking. So people may want to develop themselves in a range of personal and professional areas, such as paid work, learning, voluntary work, leisure activities, and, and family commitments, such as uh, caring for others. Sorry, I think I might just be out of sync. Oh, sorry, I'm going back. Apologies. Coming on to look at the actual Midlife Skills Review model itself. So the idea of a Midlife Skills Review was new for many of our partners and workers, but one which is rapidly gaining traction. A Midlife Skills Review offers individuals an impartial, safe, reflective space to discuss their situation, aspirations and, and plans. It's a holistic approach designed to cover many topics such as careers, uh, it could be retirement planning, um, finance, pension, pensions, training development and, and much more. Whilst the project was aimed at workers age 50 plus, the materials that we developed are suitable for all adults looking to review their skills. The project was targeted at people in the labour market with low levels of uh, basic skills in literacy, numeracy and, and digital skills. Union learning reps are uniquely placed to carry out these midlife skills reviews 
because they're trusted intermediaries and workers often confine, confide their development needs and aspirations for their future to their union learning rep, whereas workers may be more reluctant to open up about this to, to their manager. The midlife skills review, uh, in most cases, will result in an action plan that may include career signposting, training and development, and employability skills. So the model uh, we designed uh, has been adaptable so that different unions and workplaces can meet the specific needs of individuals. They can fit the review process into the time available to both the union learning rep and workers, choose topics for discussion and, res and resources best suited to those topics, and decide how and when to involve other specialist or, or, or contacts. The Value My Skills diagnostic tool digitally supports the midlife skills review process. The tool has been designed to support workers carry out a self-reflection of their transferable skills and identify those new skills they want to develop. I'd now like to play you a short showreel that demonstrates some of the key features and characteristics of the Value My Skills digital tool. Okay, excellent. That gives you a little bit of a, a flavour and insight in, into the uh, uh, Value My Skills digital tool that we developed as part of our, our project. Um, just before I move on, I, I must say I, I cannot speak highly enough of the fantastic support and expertise we received from our developers, uh, Saffron Interactive. They were absolutely brilliant. They immediately got what we were trying to achieve and designed and built a, a creative, innovative, gamified tool that met our, our users' needs. So um, Nui and her colleagues were, were outstanding. A massive uh, thanks to uh, all the excellent work you did in, in guiding us through the process and offering valuable uh, advice and insight to make improvements and enhance enhancements to the tool uh, along the way. Um, we we're also working, I must say, to a very uh, tight budget and time frame, but nonetheless, they delivered on time and, and to budget. So, um, yeah, the Saffron team, exceptionally talented. If you haven't already spoken to them about your e-learning needs or solutions, I'm having a little plug here for them, then um, I would certainly recommend you go along and have a chat with them at stand, let me get this one, F30, F30. So that's a, my little promotion for them, but they well deserve it, well deserve it. Um, here, just a sample, just a, a, a few bits of uh, uh, feedback quotes that we received from, from users um, that I just sort of pulled out. Um, you'll be able to sort of read these quotes for yourselves, but I would like to focus on one of the quotes that really shows the impact 
that this kind of intervention can have. Um, one of the users said, after the session, I realised my job wasn't right for me and my hopes for the future. Six months on, I am in an amazing new role that is allowing me to grow in a new direction. Now, this is the kind of sort of impact these kinds of interventions and support can, can, can have. And so we're looking to build on this success and we're looking at a, a phase two um, development. Uh, we're now looking to make further improvement, improvements and enhancements to the Value My Skills tool. Uh, we have been shortlisted for the final round of the Career Tech Challenge Fund. And if we are successful and secure uh, this funding, this will enable us to implement the planned phase two developments. And these include uh, a video-enabled chatbot that we use elements of AI to involve the learner and explore the learner's aspirations and motivations. It will be a holistic assessment of transferable skills, not only their job roles, but their overall life experience. The tool will be adapted to match skills to different job families, so there's a direct line of sight to different work opportunities. At key stages in the journey, learners will be celebrated, nudged, uh, and reminded that they are taking direct steps to build their future. And learners will be given a personalized overview of their skills with a direct link to potential job opportunities and a personalized learning journey that will turn thought in, in, into action. So, just finally, um, looking ahead, just to conclude and share a few thoughts on the future direction and sustainability of the Midlife Skills Review project. So, looking ahead to our future ambitions and goal for this work, uh, we believe that it is important for workers to develop their career management skills so that they have the confidence to take charge and navigate the direction they want their future career to go in. The TUC is calling for workers to have a right to a midlife skills review, and we would like to see a digitally supported midlife skills review be a key feature of the new national retraining scheme offer to support midlife workers retrain and upskill for the jobs of the future. We believe uh, that those organisations that create an age-friendly workforce where people of all ages are supported, valued and fulfilled will be more productive and better placed to meet the challenges and opportunities of the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, Ariel, I think the con the, your presentation is something the best I have seen for a while. It's super great content. And it's actually questions I'm working now in Sweden with and many global companies. Uh, very interesting. Very, very interesting. So my question is, how should, you, what should, we, how should we prepare the HR and the leadership in companies for this change that is coming? All right, so um, I was afraid of getting the question, <laughs> honestly. Uh, this all depends on the situation that you have in your organization. Uh, each uh, organization have their own uh, environment, their own uh, uh, tasks they do, uh, their own problems. Uh, 
mainly in the talk with the, with the clients that we have, and we hear such questions, we, we say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what, what, what you've heard. Uh, you need to see uh, what of those new skilling catalysts that I've pr uh, provided uh, stick to what you think is the most uh, uh, important thing that you would like to touch on first, because you cannot take all of them at once, uh, or either you are a big company, you have like the uh, really lots of the founds that you can uh, spend on the uh, on this concept but still uh, take on the like the, the, the most single more granular uh, thing that you can do and then try to like automate or, or see what is able to 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 to, um, to be able to change for this new future in mind it depends, yeah, <laughs> this is the, the response. I think it's, it's a challenge. Yeah, it Because is. we have, a, we can say, a, a huge gap with automata automation that is coming, and the leadership, HR, not knowing how to manage the workforce they have today, and the relationship they're gonna have between yeah. this new way of doing stuff. Uh, and I, I think this is something we haven't really, really solved, mm -hmm. but it's, it's something that we need to start working with. Exactly. Yeah. This, is, this is also the stats that comes from this presentation that I have just had, uh, that we have like 3% of executives that really think about how it's going to be in the future. They want to stick in the, uh, in, in the present exactly. while not thinking about the future, what might come. Thank you. Um, I had a question for Ian. Um, great presentation. I was interested in the. Sorry, your name is Ian. I just. <laughs> I was just thinking, shit, I got that wrong. Um, sorry about that. Um, I come from Australia, obviously. We talk like this all the time. Um, the My Skills platform, I'm really interested in that. Uh, I've got a business called Skills Base, and we do that for an organisation, so organisation wide. I'm interested, have you thought about extending or the portability? of the individual skills and the credentialing of those skills um, as the um, uh, as an employer or an individual might move forward mm. yeah. Uh, yeah good uh, good question um, should have maybe uh, mentioned uh, during the presentation that um, uh, the value my skills platform and, and the uh, tools and uh, resources which we've supporting resources we've developed um, are all open source um, and uh, can be accessible from the um, Union Learn website. Just a sort of word of, of caution though because um, we did originally uh, host the Value My Skills tool on our TUC Education website um, but um, because of the registration process we, we found that uh, as a bit of a barrier to um, some learners. Um, so we're in the process of migrating the tool now onto the Union Learn website, which is just uh, www.unionlearn.org.uk. Um, and that will be up and available um, to be accessed um, uh, the end of March. Uh, but all the other supporting materials we've developed as part of this project uh, are there as, as well. And, and as I say, we're hoping that um, if we're successful with this career tech challenge bid, that we'll even enhance and improve the tool further. Coming back as, as well to your point about uh, accrediting individual skills tasks, um, yeah, we, it's something um, we looked at as, as part of the project using um, uh, digital badges, and I'm not, I'm not sure sort of how familiar people are with, with, with that, um, but it's uh, something that's certainly gaining traction. Um, and, and what we found was that, yeah, there was a really good response from um, uh, workers, um, from people that 
carried out the reviews and, and then went on to learn new skills, etc., using uh, digital badges as a way as a re recognizing some of those transferable skills they developed. They may not have formal qualifications um, for some of these, but getting those, those badges, which they could then put on their social media platforms, such as Facebook, LinkedIn, etc., uh, they really thought that was beneficial. Well, thank you for that. I think the, um, it's very generous of you to make the material available, and I'll be looking into that. Um, just connecting the dots on something else that I heard in one of the other sessions, sort of this comment about how you know, there is a, a lack of trust in the modern world. Um, but interestingly, that one of the, the, one of the trust dimensions is with an employer. So people trust their employer more than they ever have, but they trust information and others less than they ever have. Um, my view is that as we move forward, there's a great opportunity for the skills that organisations are now assessing and providing to their employees are for the organisation themselves to be able to credential them and for there to be portability in that as those skills move forward. I'm wondering what you think about that. Yeah, I, I, I think that is most probably the di direction of travel. And um, we're gonna see more and more of organizations actually um, using their, their own sort of credentials or way of um, giving recognition to skills that have been developed. Um, as I mentioned, one way is through um, uh, the uh, digital badges. Um, <clears throat> I think what we've certainly found with our work as well, where it is most uh, impactful is where um, this work is done um, in partnership with um, employers and um, uh, unions. And I did make uh, quite a bit in my presentation about the union learning rep role, that trusted intermediary. And, and that is so, so important because for uh, a number of workers, uh, p particularly uh, workers with poor um, uh, literacy, numeracy, digital skills, uh, they are not going to feel confident speaking to their line manager and saying, hi, I'm not very good at this, um, I, I, I sort of need some help with this, because they think, well, m maybe they'll let me go, or maybe I'm going to be made, made, made redundant. But they are prepared to go and speak to their ULR about that because it's their co-worker, it's, yeah, it's their, their, their trusted intermediary role, and they're prepared to sort of share that and, and get that kind of support and help. I think we've probably got time for one more question. There's one of these. A little. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question a bit more going into the UR, uh, ULRs. Sorry. Um, how I have several people who could probably benefit very much from um, from that project. I don't think they know about it. Um, I'm I'm in the Royal Navy, so I don't have a link to the union, but they are civil servants and do. How do I go about engaging and introducing them to the concept? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, there's a sort of number of ways. I mean, more, more than happy for you to um, get, get in, in, in touch with um, myself um, or us at Union Learn, um, because Union Learning Reps, um, they're, they're, they're not just um, helping um, union members, but, but all their co-workers, whether they're, they're their members or not. They, they want to uh, help learners and help people to progress and, and get on at, at work. Um, where, where they don't exist, um, it's then maybe looking at then who may be best place to sort of take on that sort of trusted intermediary role. Um, and it does require some um, uh, training and, and, and support. Um, and, and we do believe that, yeah, everyone should have this opportunity of this kind of support. So um, that's why we're hoping that, um, keep my fingers crossed, if we're successful with the career tech bid, We'll have a uh, actual video chat bot, so people will be able to access that. So it, it wouldn't even matter uh, if you um, haven't got a U ULR at your workplace, you'd be able to, 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 to use that. Um, and also we're hoping, as I mentioned earlier, that um, as part of the new national retraining scheme offer, that the midlife skills review and the value my skills tool will be part of um, that kind of support and, and, and offer so that it's available to, to everyone. 
So hopefully that's answered your question, but in, maybe the easiest thing is either just speak to me or get, or get in touch with us and we'd be happy to help any way we can. Thank you. Brilliant, so all there is now is to leave me to close. And I have to say, Ariel's presentation about me having now a better understanding of automation versus augmentation, and maybe not being so scared of robots taking over the world and, you know, we're not going to be needed. Um, it's also wonderful to hear there's a human element to this, right? And even across Ian's work, you know, to actually having someone to speak to about this and realising how essential our skills are and transferable, even if the jobs don't exist yet, that we're going to end up doing. I think the big question, and you asked this as well, the thing that we've been left with is, and how do our leadership deal with this change that is you know, not about to happen, but it is coming, and it's going to be quite major, and change is going to be a constant thing, and trust we've heard a lot of in the other sessions as well. So what I would love you to do is put your hands together for Ariel and for Ian, and I'm sure they'll be around for a bit afterwards if you do want to ask questions. So thank you very much.